Hello again and welcome to another Warhammer 40k Mordian Glory video. In today's episode, I will be reviewing every single relic in the 9th edition Imperial Guard Codex, so you know which ones to take and which ones to avoid. So without further ado, let's open up the Imperial Commander's Armory and have a good old rummage around inside. But before we get into the nitty gritty of each individual relic, first let's go over some important pertinent information. Firstly, it's good to understand that there are essentially three different types of relic, and depending on which ones you pick will have a big impact on how you will end up using them on the battlefield. So for example, you have got combat, durability, and support relics. Combat relics are your relic weapons, things like heroic power swords or special pistols. They tend to boost the damage output of a single individual model. You've then got durability relics. These are designed to make units much more tanky. Now, sometimes there can be a bit of a crossover between durability and support relics. We'll cover that when we get to it. But by and large, the difference between a combat and a durability is combat boosts the damage output, how much shit you can throw at the wall, and durability tends to boost how many punches you can take to the face on a certain squad. We then have the support relics. And support relics are those things that on the individual officer or unit that is carrying the relic, you won't be improving your damage output or your durability, but you will be supporting other units around you. They tend to come with some kind of aura effect or some kind of special ability that allows you to pull off a trick or tactic within the game. Support relics can be very varied and they can come with all sorts of different potent force multipliers that you can apply to your army. Overall, I tend to find within the guard support relics to be the most important category. And that is because in the Imperial Guard, we're not really short of damage dealers. We've got loads of tanks and we've got loads of artillery and infantry that can slingshots at the enemy. But what we tend to need is ways of making our units perform better on the battlefield because individually, one for one, our guys aren't very good. And any way that we can give them a step up and a leg up is very important. Because of this, I would say that there is a golden rule for when you're trying to decide which relics you want to include in your army. And that is relics that affect multiple units tend to be better than those that only affect one model or one squad. And the last thing to mention before we dive right into this thing is you want to be aware of a couple of stratagems for your army when it comes to getting relics into your force. So the first one is the Imperial Commander's Armory. This is the stratagem that physically allows you to take extra relics in your army. Of course, you can spend one CP to take a relic from the core rules and then if you want to take additional relics on top of that you're going to want to use the imperial commander's armory stratagem after that you've got the battlefield bequest this is a really important stratagem because it is the fundamental basis on how you can build certain things like kazakin bombs and death stars it allows you to give a relic to a model that has the sergeant or watchmaster word in their profile this is how you can get things like the Barbican's Key on a Kazakhin Sergeant. So Battlefield Bequest and Imperial Commander's Armory are very important and make sure that you become familiar with them when it comes to picking your relics and where you want to go in your army list. But with all of that covered, now let's dive into the relics themselves. And we'll start off with the combat ones. These tend to be upgrades for a single model with the intention being to significantly boost the damage output of that officer. Often they tend to be more fluffy than crunchy. If you want your senior officer running around with a relic power sword because it looks cool and you've got some homebrew lore for that, you're probably going to want to give him more than just a basic power sword. You want to give him a relic. However, this rule is not set in stone. As you will see, there is at least one relic in this area, which is not only good, but downright competitive and often considered an auto include. But without me teasing you and edging you anymore, let's now dive into the individual relics that we can find in this category. 
Starting us off, we have the Emperor's Benediction. This is a relic bolt pistol. It can only be given to commissars, so sadly you can't put this on an officer. It has the range of 18 inches, pistol 3, strength 4, AP minus 1, and 2 damage. So it's a pretty spicy bolt pistol and it's one that's been in the guard codex for a while now it's a pretty traditional relic i'm not sure how many people will take it but it is pretty cool to have a commissar special relic in there now the cool thing about the average prediction is it has over the edition slowly but surely got a little bit better and now it has an ability where you can essentially use it as like a sniper pistol Characters don't get to look out, so against it. And if you get a six to wound, then it inflicts a mortal wound in addition to any normal damage. To be totally honest with you guys, this is purely a fluff upgrade. You are probably not going to include this in any serious competitive guard list. It's a cool relic, but honestly, you don't take commissars to the damage output. And so really, this one is better left on the shelf. At the total opposite end of the spectrum, we have Gatekeeper. Gatekeeper is a relic battle cannon that can only be taken by a tank commander, and you can only put it on a Lehman Russ with the Lehman Russ battle cannon. It replaces the normal cannon profile with a 72 inch range, heavy D3 plus 6, strength 9, AP minus 3, and 3 damage. Now, the difference between this and a regular battle cannon is a regular battle cannon is D6 plus three shots, which means it gets a minimum of four. And this one is heavy six, so you've always got that six shots in the bank, plus D3. So it's got a much higher number of shots, much more higher average number of shots, this thing's pumping out, and a much higher minimum as well. It's strength 9 over strength 8, and it's AP minus 3 over AP minus 2, and it still is damage 3. Of course, it's still blast. Of course, it's still turret weapon. Gatekeeper is honestly one of those relics that most Imperial Guard commanders do not leave without. It is considered by many to be one of the best combat relics in Warhammer 40k, let alone just in the Guard Putting it on a tank commander is also fantastic because they're really durable profiles. They are designed to be doing damage anyway. So you're just boosting a unit's already very potent battlefield role. So Gatekeeper is fantastic. And honestly, I can recommend it. You should seriously be considering it for every single list that you're taking that has at least one tank commander. It's just a straight upgrade over a standard battle cannon. Next up, we've got the Legacy of Caladius, and this is a Relic Chainsword. Now, the advantage of this Relic is, outside of having to spend a CP to take it, it's free. You don't have to buy a Power Sword and then swap it out for a Relic Power Sword or anything like that. Nope, you can take any Officer or Commissar or Sergeant equipped with a Chainsword, and you can give them this Relic. Now, it is a Chainsword that is plus one strength, Minus two AP and two damage. And each time the bearer fights, it makes three additional attacks with this weapon. That is a hell of an upgrade over your standard chainsaw. Your standard chainsaw gives you no extra AP, no extra strength. It's just the extra attack. So all of those extra bonuses is really, really good. The problem I would have with the legacy of Caladius is you're trying to make a guard officer's combat output better and at the end of the day guard characters and sergeants don't tend to be very good combat characters even if you give them relics and stuff even a basic space marine captain probably has a good chance of beating you in a duel with no upgrades so that's kind of my problem with giving your officers combat relics like this you're putting them in the line of fire where they really don't want to go so it is more of a fluff upgrade there is a argument to be made that you could potentially use this to upgrade a Kazakin sergeant and you can make some kind of pretty nasty combat squad with it. Remember, each Kazakin comes with two attacks. Sergeant would come with three attacks base, would then get an additional three for having this relic chainsword. You can give them the legacy of Caladius using the battlefield bequest stratagem. And then if you took your Kazakin with the brutal strength extra regimental doctrine you're starting to look at a sergeant who's actually 
strength five with this weapon. And suddenly he's becoming quite the combat master. You start telling him to fix bayonets. This thing's going up to AP minus three. Two damage a pop. The sergeant's going to be hitting on threes. If you've got a officer nearby, he'll be re-rolling ones. So there is a way you can potentially build a combat Kazakin squad using this. It's just a little bit tricky and you might be putting a lot of effort into making a combat Kazakhstan squad when really you're better off just shooting people anyway with those units it's an option i thought i'd mention it at the end of the day i would definitely put this in the fluffy category and to be honest with you guys i can make the next relic review really quick because i'm just going to end up saying the same thing about the claw of the desert tigers as I did about the legacy of Cladis. It's an upgrade for a power sword this time rather than a chain sword. It's a combat relic. You can make some kind of combat Kazakhstan squad with it, but realistically, it's a fluff upgrade if you want to represent some kind of heirloom weapon on your army. That's it. It's a fluff one. If you're comparing the legacy of Cladis to the Claw of Desert Tigers, they're pretty similar. The legacy of Cladis gets an extra attack but is only uh, an extra strength and an extra 2 AP, where the Claw of Desert Tigers gives you plus 2 strength, AP minus 3, and damage 2, but you only get 2 additional attacks. So basically, do you want a Chainsaw that's going to give you more, but slightly less good attacks, or do you want a Power Sword that's still going to give you some bonus attacks, but each one of those is going to be a bit punchier? Really, they're pretty much the same, and it's personal preference on which one of those you really want to take. Bear in mind, for some units, you're going to have to pay for that power sword and then swap it out for the Claw of the Tigers. So the Legacy of Cladius, in some circumstances, will be slightly cheaper points-wise. Otherwise, they're very similar, and the same sort of analysis applies to both of them. Now, interestingly, the next relic we're going to be looking at, even though it is a relic weapon... I actually think it does have some pretty significant play and can be a staple in some guard armies. And this is the Emperor's Fury. And this is a Relic Plasma Pistol. Now, the reason why the Relic Plasma Pistol, in my mind, is infinitely more useful than a Relic Sword is because it shoots stuff. And guard prefer to shoot stuff. And anything that boosts your shootiness is very good. So it's a bit like, a bit like Gatekeeper. It's a good upgrade uh it does a lot more damage and unlike the emperor's benediction you can take this on kazakhan sergeants or scion sergeants or any other kind of sergeant and it will actually give them a big damage output boost rather than the emperor's benediction which you can only put on a commissar so the emperor's fury is a 12 inch range it's pistol three it's strength eight it's ap minus three it's damage two it's basically like a permanently overcharged plasma pistol that fires three shots and never gets hot if I was to include this in my army, I would take this on a unit of Kazakin. And I would put the, that unit of Kazakin in a Chimera. And I'd take for their extra regimental doctrine, mechanized infantry. And I would go for a unit that can just jump out of a Chimera and absolutely just blow away an enemy unit. If you took a unit of Kazakin with this, plus two plasma gun specialists, plus two melter guns, plus you're going to have a guy who can throw a crack grenade, plus you're going to have the hotshot sniper, you've got a unit that's putting out seven plasma shots, two melter shots, a crack grenade, and a hotshot sniper round, and a bunch of hotshot rifle rounds as well. And you could support that unit with various stratagems, like you can use armored fists so you get rerolls to wound. You could use mount up so they can jump out, shoot, jump back in. You can have an officer nearby so that they can get reroll ones to hit and that they can get orders like take aim. I think that the Empress Fury is actually good. I think it's competitive if you build it into that mechanized Kazakhstan squad loadout. So overall, out of the combat relics, I would say you should avoid the Empress Benediction, the Legacy of Caladius, and the Claw of the Desert Tigers. I would say the Empress Benediction is by far the worst relic. I would say that Gatekeeper is a fantastic combat relic, and you should definitely be looking to include that in most of your guard armies going forward. And I would say the Empress Fury is one you can include in your army if you build around it, but if you're not going to form it into some kind of Kazakhstan punchy squad, 
it's another one you can probably leave at home. So the only one here that I'd say is fantastic and an auto include is probably Gatekeeper. But moving on, we've got the durability relics. Now, these tend to be upgrades for units. You'll find the majority of the relics in this category are ones you're going to want to put on command squads. And the overall effect is it makes them dead hard. It makes them incredibly tanky. Now, even though we're still looking at upgrades that tend to affect individuals or small units... The advantage of these relics is that you can use them to make some incredibly tanky and actually competitive builds. And the first one we're going to look at is probably the best one. And this is the Death Mask of Alonius. Now, the Death Mask of Alonius gives the bearer and the unit a 4 plus invulnerable save. This is brilliant. And it's fundamentally one of the parts that you need to include in your army if you're looking at taking a Dreadnought Command Squad. A Dreadnought Command Squad is an unkillable command squad. It's incredibly powerful. It's a competitive tactic that I have used at multiple tournaments and it really does punch well above its weight. Basically, take the Death Mask of Alonius Pass, take Nort Dead Dog, put it in a Cadian Command Squad and then you can use Cadius stands on that Command Squad to the point where you've got a 4 plus save on the unit, you've got transhuman on the unit and you've got a five per save thanks to medic just to be clear the death mask doesn't go on nork death mask goes on the officer in the command squad and then you put nork in there it's really good and overall a very competitive tactic and i actually have done a video on this and if i remember i will link it at the end of this video or put it down in the description so keep your eye out for that in a very similar vein, you've got the Order of the Bastion Stellaris, except for rather than giving the officer and his unit a 4% vulnerable save, this gives the officer and his unit a permanent transhuman ability. That means they can only ever be wounded on a 4, 5, or 6. doesn't matter if you hit them with the Volcano Cannon, a 1, 2, or 3 always fails. Now, trying to pick between the Death Mask and the Order of the Bastion Stellaris is kind of going to come down to how you're building your Dreadnought. If you're taking Nort Dead Dog himself, you're going to want the Death Mask because it's the best way of getting a 4 plus invulnerable save on a squad that otherwise won't really have an invulnerable save. If you're going to take a regular Ogrim Bodyguard, then you're probably better off with the Order of the Bastion Stellaris. The reason for this is the regular Ogrim Bodyguard can take a 4 plus invulnerable save with his Brute Shield. And so you don't need the Death Mask. And what you can do is have a permanently transhuman unit instead. The reason why you've got to sort of think about which one of these you want to pick is it's going to come down to do you want the extra wound that comes with Nort Dead Dog? And also, do you want your whole squad to have a 4 plus invulnerable save? The reason why I prefer the Death Mask over the Bastion Stellaris is because I like the extra wound, especially combined with the fact that Ogren Bodyguards, including Nork, reduce damage by one. And I also like the fact that the whole command squad gets that 4 plus invulnerable save. If you go down the regular Bodyguard Bastion Stellaris route, that squad is very, very durable until suddenly when the Ogren Bodyguard goes down and then suddenly everyone dies because you haven't got that... 4 plus and say that's just cutting out half of the damage that you're taking. And so that's why I prefer Death Mask plus Nork over Bastion plus regular bodyguard. But honestly, it's going to come down to player preference. That was my preference. You guys may have different mileage. So let me know which one of these you actually prefer. Let me know down in that comment section. Lastly, in the durability relics, we've got the armor of Graf Toshenko. This is actually a very cool relic. It's actually a very venerable one. We've had it for a long time. It harkens back to the old City Fight Codex, I think in 4th or 5th edition. It's related to the story of this destroying commander that ended up getting absolutely smashed by the Tau, but he fought heroic last stand, and that spirit sort of got imbued in his armor. It's very, very cool. The problem with the armor of Graf Toshenko is it only affects the bearer. Unlike the Death Mask and the Bastion Stellaris, who, which affect all units, this is only going to affect your officer. It gives your officer uh, an extra wound. Kind of cool. That means you can get a six wound Cadian Castellum, which is kind of mad. And it does give you a two plus save. So again, you can essentially have like a Terminator Captain running around because you're going to have a two plus save, five plus invulnerable save and six wounds. But the issue is you're still only a toughness three character. 
so you're not that tough. It's fun, it's fluffy. Again, it's there to represent some sort of heirloom in your crusade army or your fluffy guard army. But by and large, it is the weakest of the three durability relics in the codex. It's probably the one that you're going to leave at home every time. But that covers the combat and durability relics. Now let's move on to the largest category of relic in the guard codex, which is the support relics. Like I said at the beginning of the video, support relics do tend to be better. GW has obviously acknowledged that and they've given us a shitload of them for our codex. The problem you're going to find with support relics is you're going to want to take multiple of them and you're going to end up spending loads of uh, CP pre-game. You're going to have to be disciplined when it comes to picking just one or two of these things you're going to want to include in your army. But there are a few auto includes that you're going to want to take pretty much every time. Support relics, like I said, are typically the most useful. They support several squads. And the big thing about them is they tend to be combat multipliers. They're going to affect multiple units. They're going to give a large section of your army a big damage boost, even if the unit themselves that's wielding them isn't getting any direct benefit from it. Starting off, we have the Tactical Auto Reliquary of Tiberius. This is a very simple relic. It goes on an officer model only. In your command phase, the bearer can issue one additional order that it knows. This is a fantastic relic to put on a command squad. In fact, a really cool combination with this is to take the Tactical Auto Reliquary of Tiberius plus superior tactical training, put it on a Cadian command squad and have a unit that can do two orders a turn at a 24 inch range and it can do both perfect disorders and it can do regimental orders. This relic is one of the simplest, but it is also one of the best. And in my opinion, you cannot go wrong with popping this in one of your command squads. We then have the Barbican's Keep. This is a very controversial relic because it is considered brutally overpowered by many in the wider competitive community. By itself, it's not such a big deal. You put this on a unit. You can put this on a Kazakhin unit using the uh, Battlefield Bequest stratagem. And it allows us to teleport across the board. It's kind of like Dark Matter Crystal. It allows you to pick the unit up and redeploy it in the same turn. And you have to stay nine inches away. The reason this relic is so powerful is it pairs well with Kazakin and loads of other stratagems and abilities that allow you to get a Kazakin squad that's pumping out 18 mortal wounds a turn, in theory, on paper. It's a great relic for just that alpha strike from the Kazakin bomb. It's also a great relic to have for tactical flexibility. You may actually want to keep this relic in your back pocket until turn four, turn five and use it not as a damage dealer, but to zip over to the enemy side of the board late game when most of their screening and most of their army is dead and do a cheeky little bit of retrieve battlefield data. One of the hard parts of doing that secondary is you tend to struggle to get it in the later turns and get it in your opponent's table half because they've been screening you out and they've been stopping your deep strikes at your silence from achieving it. The Barbican's Key allows you to literally sit a squad at the back of the board the whole game gets to turn five and you go, you know what? I'm going to turn the key. I'm going to pop over, retrieve my data and more than likely get myself four extra secondary points. And remember, points win games. So the Barbican's Key is, again, another fantastic relic and one that a lot of guard players are going to want to include in their army, both for damage and tactical reasons. Next up, we have Kurov's Aquila. This is a pretty cool one, but I do feel it's a bit more of a big wrinkly brain relic than the other ones we've looked at. It will require you to have a little bit of skill at 4D chess. Essentially, Curves Aquila allows you to once per game increase the CP cost of an opponent's stratagem, excluding the command reroll. So if your opponent has a really clutch stratagem that you know his army is kind of built around, you can just be like, that's going to cost you one CP extra for the rest of the game. It's really, 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 really good. The problem is that it kind of relies upon your opponent having a stratagem like that in their army, that they fundamentally build everything around it. It's a cool one. I tend to find it more of a inconvenience for your opponent, not one that is going to entirely ruin them and break their plans. But it's definitely not a bad relic at all. And in the right hands... And against the right opponent, could be game winning. It's a bit more situational. We then have the relic of Lost Cadia. Now, this is 
a little toned down in comparison to what it was in the old codex, but it's still very, very good. Essentially, once per game in any command phase, that includes your opponents, you can reveal the Relic of Lost Cadia. In the turn that it is revealed, while friendly Cadian infantry units are within six inches of this model, you get to improve the weapon skill and ballistic skill characteristics of that model in that unit by one. And plus one to the attacks and leadership characteristic of models in that unit too. So basically, if you have a Cadian command squad and you reveal the relic, you can boost a shitload of Cadian shock troopers and Kazakin around you. What's really interesting about this is you're not giving them a plus one to hit. You're giving them a plus one to their ballistic skill characteristic. That means you can absolutely stack Relic of Lost Cadia and take aim. And for a turn, you can have all of your Cadian Shock Troopers hitting on twos. You've got a nearby officer re-rolling ones. Turns every Cadian Trooper into a Kazakin for a turn. It's very powerful. It is certainly one that you want to build your army around. It's certainly one that if you take it, you will get a good amount of damage boost from it. The only problem is that it's once per game and it's got some pretty stiff competition. I am surprised we haven't seen this relic popping up a little bit more, but I do think that the only reason we're not seeing it is because of other relics like the Barbican's Key like the finial of the number dash first which we'll get to later they are so good that i think they're kind of overshadowing the relic of lost cadia if either of those relics get nerfed or changed we'll probably see people taking the lost cadian relic next up we've got the size sigil of sanctum it's a pretty straightforward relic you put it on a psyker they know one extra power and they can cast one extra power it's not a bad relic it's just one that you'll probably struggle to bother with Sounds kind of harsh, but psychic powers have never been the main strong point of the guard. And in this codex, we have fewer psychic abilities and units than ever before. We've only got an ash pattern of primary psychic. We've got no weird veins or anything else now. And inquisitors aren't quite as easy to include in our force as they once were. So overall, it's fine, but it's one that you'll probably end up leaving at home. I'm sure there is some kind of mortal wound damage boost beast out there that you can put together with it. I'm sure there might be some way of making Ashpath actually half decent with it. But overall, I think it's one that is fairly low down in the priority pile. Laws of Command is up next. And this is, again, a bit like Kurov's Aquila. It's going to require a big brain, but it could be game winning in the right circumstances. And with someone who's got an IQ higher than my tiny Ogren brain. Basically, it's another once per battle only relic. And at the start of any of your opponent's turns, the bear can issue one order it knows, as if it was your command phase. Now, it cannot be any order. It can be fixed bayonets, take cover at all costs, show them steel, show them contempt, remain vigilant, and shock and awe. Now, the reason this relic is potentially so massive is because if your opponent has a turn one teleport style unit, and he's going to try and use that to put some very early game pressure on you. You could use this to issue Remain Vigilant. And they'd have to stay 12 inches away from the majority of your front line. Especially if you splash the order out a little bit. But it's once per game. It's damn situational. And in most cases, you're not going to find a use for it. I think that... Like I said, someone who's a bit smarter than me could probably come up with a really, really good reason why this is an auto-include and why it's something that you should be taking every game and it's this massive anti-meta top-tier, top-table unit. But for me, I think it's probably one that most guard players aren't going to bother with. And so I would probably say you don't need it. And then we have my favourite relic. Not because it's good, but because it has the best name in the world. It is... The Clarion Proclamatus. The Clarion Proclamatus. It's a super Voxcaster. It's a mega, mega Voxcaster. Basically, uh, you put this on a command squad with a Master Vox and you get infinite range orders. It's pretty cool. It's actually one that I think a lot of guard players will end up taking because it's 
good. And you'll find that there's always going to be that time when you really, really need an order to go off to a far-flung unit. And it's just, just out of the old regular Voxcaster range. It pairs really well with superior tactical training. It allows you, a bit like with the tactical auto reliquy, you can use the Clarion Proclamatus with superior tactical training to get infinite range perfect disorders on one of your command squads. I have used this combo in a number of battle ports and it has been very effective. I think the only reason you find people aren't taking the Clarion Proclamatus is because they're taking the next relic, which is, in my opinion, the best relic in all of Warhammer 40k, and that is the Finial of the Nemrodesh First. The Finial of the Nemrodesh First is, again, a command squad upgrade, and it goes on the banner bearer, the regimental standard. And all friendly units that are core, that are within six inches of the command squad, ignore to hit modifiers, they ignore feel no pain, they ignore phase caps, they ignore damage reduction, and essentially it's just a massive damage boost to a huge portion of your army. The finial of the Nemodesh first is affectionately, well affectionately by the guard community and very unaffectionately by everyone else, the big bullshit banner of doom. Because you can put this thing in a unit of scions, or you put it on a command squad that's in the center of a big unit of scions, and suddenly you've got a unit of scions or a unit of Kazakin that are with take aim, hitting on twos, you're rolling ones. And it doesn't matter if the enemy's going through dense terrain, doesn't matter if the enemy's got some sort of inbuilt minus one to hit modifier, doesn't matter, you're still hitting them on twos because you ignore all the hit modifiers. And then it doesn't matter if you're facing off against Gazgul or a Catan or a Baden, it ignores phase caps. So. He just gets killed straight away. And one of the big problems that Guard tends to face is those units that do have face caps. Because we're primarily a shooting army, it means things like Catan that can take us three or four turns to kill because they're regrowing wounds. We can only do like three a turn to them. Suddenly, that's not a problem. You just blow them away in one turn. Oh, you're gone. You're dead. No face caps. Goodbye. And then when you take into account like armies like Death Guard, it completely screws them. Because Death Guard can't use their reduced damage on any of their stuff. And it just compl and that's their whole thing, right? So it and they can't use their psychic powers, like I think it's miasma, which is mass one tit. It's just really, really good. And the main reason why it's so powerful is because you put it on the command squad and it affects everyone who's in range of the command squad, not just the banner bearer. So if you string your command squad out, you can affect a huge portion of your army. Take it from me, the finial of the Nemodesh first is the auto include relic it is the one you're going to put in every single one of your armies even if you don't build around it massively with things like kazakh and death balls and sign death balls it's still your go-to relic it's unbelievably powerful and it is what makes so many other factions jealous of us it's that fan it's that good all right now i do realize that on this slide i've misspelled it. it's not the fin finial of he nemodesh first but it's the finial of the nemodesh first but apart from that spelling mistake it is the best relic, I can assure you. But from our best relic to our worst, we've got the Null Coat. It goes under Better Prime or Commissar. They can deny a psychic power in the opponent's phase, and it gets plus one. You just don't need it. Guard players don't tend to do much psychic stuff, and to be honest, when it comes to competitive 40k, factions either are all in to such an overwhelming degree on the psychic phase, like thousands and grey knights, that having an extra deny with a minus one means fuck all. And it's not going to do anything. You're not going to even slow them down. Or you come across other armies which just are like guard. They're just not even playing in the psychic phase. We don't even care about it. So unfortunately, the Norco, it's just not enough. If it was like, whilst you are in range of the Norco, you get an attempt to deny all your opponent's psychic powers, but you don't get a bonus. It's just you get a chance to do it. That would be massive. That would be auto-include. It would also probably be too powerful. But the problem is that it's just, when it comes to the competitive meta, it's just not worth it. You're never going to pick that over the finial. So you leave it at home, boys. It's probably our worst relic. And last, but definitely not least, because least is the null coat, we have the refractor field generator. This is for a Tempesta Prime model only. And whilst friendly military arm Tempesta's infantry units are within six inches of this model, they get a five plus invulnerable save. I don't know why the refractor field generator is so discriminatory towards regular guard people, but apparently the Gungun shield dome doesn't protect the regular 
troopers. It only protects the Tempest of Scions. It's actually a really good relic. It's definitely one that I would include as a secondary relic in a pure Scions army. If you were to take pure Scions, in my opinion, you're going to take the Finial of the Nemodesh first, and then you're probably going to take the Refractor Field Generator as the two relics you're going to pretty much auto-include in your army every single time. Outside of pure Scions, though, it's probably one you're not going to bother with. You've got other relics that are going to be helping you out. But when Scions are your main force, you need to make sure that you can boost their durability as much as possible because sounds are pretty fragile the four plus armor save doesn't really mean a lot so having that five minimal save just means 33 percent of all damage coming in against your sounds that are being affected by the generator is just cut out which is great never underestimate the ability for someone to roll an inordinate amount of five plus vulnerable saves I really like it. It's good, but it's a not a situational one, but a specific one for a specific kind of guard army. You're not going to take it in a regular guard force, but it is an auto include for pure Scion players for sure. And that covers all of the relics in the 9th edition Imperial Guard Codex. I hope you guys found it useful. Let me know which is your favorite relic down in the comments section below. If you enjoyed today's video, make sure you smash that like button like it is a big titty out our girlfriend. And also subscribe to never miss an episode. If you really enjoyed today's video or you found it particularly helpful, then please consider becoming a channel member or Patreon supporter. One of the big perks of being a channel member or patreon is you gain access to the mordian glory discord which is an online community of almost a thousand active members it's always popping off in the mg discord we've got army list advice tactics we've got hobbying and painting areas and we've also got a pretty spicy meme section as well and I just wanted to say a big thank you to all of the latest channel members. So thank you to Zach Silby, Wicked Assassin 55, Andrew Ali, A Lot of Fluffy Hair, Christian, Thomas, Luke, Ike and Ike, Leroy Jenkins, Blissful Badger, David Stringfellow, Nico, Tom Curtis, Paint Liquors Paint Pot, Steve Rackus, Harley, Sunny D, British Trex, Joshua Renoff, M.O., Max Rowe, Marcus, Tony Tiger, Abraham, Lorenzo, Bruce, Connor M., Chris, Aaron Bill 3, Daniel Murphy, Dylan, Chenkov, Hunter 404, and Walnuts Warrior. Thank you guys for becoming channel members. Thank you for doing your part. I also want to do a shout out to the latest Patreon supporters as well. So a massive thank you to Jareth, Zachary, Matthew, Erica, Nathan, Dakota, Peter, Tim, Leslie, Max, Gibraltar, SM, Philip, and Theora. Thank you guys for becoming Patreon supporters. And last, but certainly not least, I want to say a special, personal, heartfelt thank you to all of my top tier Patreon supporters. These are the war masters, the people who have truly gone above and beyond the call of duty. So a massive thank you to all of you guys, to Alan Blunt III, Bon Bon Vert, Mark Panconi, Ross Miller, Sawfish Trombone, Watchmaster134-4, Alex Stengal, John Stubbs, Nick Walsh, Diesel Fox, Tom Sutton, and Sly Varney. Thank you guys. Your ongoing support is incredibly helpful. It's a big part of what allows me to do this channel full time. I hope you enjoyed today's video. Thank you for watching. And of course, as always, I'll see you guys next time.